Brent, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Ryan. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I'm so excited. Like we were just saying, I, uh, I, you know, it's been four years actually is what I looked at. I was like, oh my God, it's been since, yeah, I mean, four years, probably, lots gone on over the last four years since uh, I had you on and you guys rebranded. And I was just saying that I've been so, it's been so enjoyable to watch you, you know, just beating the steady drum of the just different flavor of private equity that you have. And uh, I'm excited to, you know, continue to uh, highlight people like yourself and some other gentlemen like uh, Sonny Vanderbeck and Story Capital that are just taking a completely different approach to this entire place of uh, private equity. And so, you know, within this mini series, Brent, about, you know, through the eyes of the buyer, we spend so much time in our training program and the podcast talking about how valuations work from like, you know, the intrinsic value to like, you know, all the strategic reasons someone could sell and maximize purchase price. And the one thing that we constantly are trying to help people understand is how does the buyer and the types of buyers that are in front of them impact the valuation the deal structure and the role. Because I think there's a lot of ambiguity around that. And you have got just such a unique model that I think not only can you can speak to your model and how that compares to other people's models, but then also what that means for the for the owners. Cause I, I just, you know, from your last conversation we had, you really care and you've been there, done that. And so I appreciate you coming back on. And why don't you for the listeners that haven't heard um, kind of the update of permanent equity, but maybe just kind of give us a little bit of your background as well as uh, kind of the evolution to where you are today for with permanent equity. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for asking the question. Um, yeah, I grew up in Joplin, Missouri, uh, so southwest corner of uh, the state, and um, went to school on the East Coast. Came back to get my law degree and my MBA at Mizzou, where I met this girl who I called the sexy scientist for a year before I asked her out. So you know, it's always about a girl. The story's got to always be about a girl, right? Um, and uh, we, we fell in love, and she had a couple years left on her PhD, and so I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I I knew I wasn't going to. Um, I wasn't going to practice law. I didn't want to practice law. And I, I, I was ready to do something. I, I feel like I was in school. And so I um, drank too much one night and was out with a friend and his wife said, I want to start a business. So I said, great, me too. So let's start <laughs> All the great ideas happen like that, right? <laughs> Gosh, it was a terrible decision. Uh, my, my whole life is a trophy of grace uh, where, you know, I, uh, I think I'm so smart and it turns out I was being really dumb and uh, somehow God weaves it all together for, for my good and his glory. Um, so yeah, so I uh, started a business and that was a terrible disaster, but that led into starting a business that was a, a better business, uh, still not a great business. And then that led into getting introduced to a guy who my mutual acquaintance had said, I got, he got left at the altar for the second time and I should meet him, not because I should try to go buy his business, but just because he was in the same industry and was going to continue to be in that industry. And so... Um, I took that to mean though I should try to go buy his business because why else would you tell me that? And uh, I was 24, 25 at the time, and you know I'm 39 now. I looked about 14 then. I mean I <laughs> I can't I can't tell you. Um, he literally the so I sat across the table from this guy and 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 he said why am I sitting here? He like was so confused. He was like two grown men have tried to buy my business. Why am I sitting here? And I was like. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I'm here to clean your floors your or buy your business, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and so we talked a little bit. He brought an NDA. I didn't know anything. I didn't really understand. I mean, I knew what an NDA was, but I didn't understand, you know, what kind of what was going on too much and asked him some questions. And he said, here's what I want to, you know, if you want to try to buy my business, here's what I'm going to need. And that's what the same, these other two guys had tried to buy the business for. And I said, well, sir, I appreciate that. There may be a reason why you didn't close because I think it's too high. I'm not sure I could get that done, but here's what I think I could get done. And it was just all based on what the downside for me was. I didn't really, I, I knew I didn't know, but I knew that if I mm-hmm. bought it at, at, at a price where I you know, was humble in, in the price I was willing to pay, then I, I think you know, I'd have a better shot at it. And he said, well, that's nice, but there's no way I would ever sell it to you for the price that you, know, you just said. So Godspeed, and he slid the check across the table, and and uh, I honestly, I never planned on talking to him again. Uh, seven months later, he called me up and said, "The business is in great shape. We just renewed our largest account. I'm exhausted. Um, I'll sell it to you for the price you asked for, but it's got to cl- uh, close all cash sixty days from now." Hmm. And I was like, "Well, that's a heck of a Tuesday." Um, <laughs> okay. And then, you know, it's kind of like that moment where you get in the elevator and the doors close and you're like, oh, wow, we just got the big account. Now what? Um, yeah, so I exactly. called in every favor and I had no idea what I was doing. I called my lawyer and I was like, hey, uh, so have you ever bought a business? He's like, yeah, sure. I've done plenty of real estate deals. And I was like, no, no, no. Have you ever bought a business? He's like, no, but I mean, it's 
about the same thing, right? Like just straightforward, like, well, you know, we just need to do diligence. And so I typed into Google D O diligence, right? <laughs> Due diligence. <laughs> that is awesome, and man. I've not heard that story. That's amazing. It's true. It's true. <laughs> and, and sure enough, it comes up, you know, D U E diligence. And I start clicking on these lists and I'm like, Oh, it's just, you just ask them questions. How hard can this be? Oh. Um, you know, two, two weeks before closing, it struck me that how, where's the cash going to come from to operate the business after I bought it? He was like, well, you got a working capital line of credit, right? I said, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't even think about it. Right. So when I say I knew nothing, I knew nothing. And, um, closed on the business with an SBA loan, asked my newly married wife to sign a personal guarantee and, you know, really rolled the dice. And that was a huge uh, inflection point in my life. Um, did well with that deal. Um, it, it forced me to get up and out of the day-to-day operations of both businesses then. And that ended up becoming a huge advantage. I mean, but, but look, early on, things were, it was a disaster, man. It was, uh, I was a terrible boss. I, uh, it was all about me. I was incredibly egocentric and demanding. And man, when you, when you mix in, some success into that equation, uh, you get some pretty volatile results. So, uh, anyway, but I, I, um, decided I should do more of that, right. Do more of what works and less of what doesn't. So I tried to find other opportunities and we hired some people to try to help that on that side, um, eventually found, uh, and did three other deals and then started getting noticed and ultimately took on outside capital in this very unusual structure that we have. So took on $50 million in 2000. Uh, 17, and then took on uh, $300 million at the end of 2019 and rebranded the firm. I was trying to be too cute. It just shows you, man, all my, all my ideas about how I think I'm going to be clever. They never end up being good. Like my, my, I'm, I, I'm too clever for my own good sometimes. And so we, we called originally called the, the, the firm adventures, right? Cause it was an adventure and capitalism is adventures in general. Like we wanted to go on adventures, but we, you know, our domain, uh, we got was the hack domain. So it was the shortest domain. So a D V E N T U R dot E S. Well, our target audience is like over 55. And I don't know how many times that we were asked if we were like a Spanish travel company, <laughs> or like why people were so confused, um, <laughs> you know, and people would call it like ad, ad, adventures, ad, adventures. Like I, how many like people, people would like do that? And then the dot com at the end too, just in probably oh, like dot com <laughs> for sure. They dot com. And anyway, so eventually we figured out maybe we should change our name to be more descriptive of who we actually are. And so we changed the name to, to permanent equity and that's where we are today. So there's uh, 19 of us now. Uh, we're wow, primarily cool. based in Columbia, Missouri, and we've got, I think the best investors in the world, I feel like I've got the best job in the world and, um, I enjoy where I live. I love the people I get to work with. Uh, we got plenty of problems for sure. We got plenty of problems, but, um, we've got great investors and great people we work with and we get to interact with really interesting companies and, and we're, I don't know, there's like a, so all private equity kind of gets brushed with the same brush. Like there's, there's Mm -hmm. definitely like white collar private equity, which we're not. And there's definitely like blue collar private equity. And we're like the, on the blue end of blue collar private equity. So we like to, we like to get into the muck and the mire and, and, and the messiness of all of it and, and try to help these, these companies um, be stewarded. Well, we're trying to steward them well. So we're trying to steward companies that, that care what happens next. I appreciate the background, Brent. And like, um, I want to kind of take a, a couple of these components because of like how, how the, how it's unique and how you raise your money. Cause that's indicative of then like what you're doing afterwards, the deal structure, all that kind of technical stuff. But before we do that, where in your journey did you go? Like, how did you become humble? Like you are right now? Cause you, you, you were, you were explaining how you were cute or it was all about you, but now you've got a different approach towards it. And just kind of curious where that transition period happened. Yeah. Well, um, it was from all the beatings I got, um, to be honest. Um, I mean, look what life has a way of, of humbling you. And, and I think that the response to, to that is, is really important. Right. And, and one of the things that I'm, I'm really grateful for is that I was uh, given the opportunity to be self-reflective and, and be surrounded by people who cared about me and who were willing to speak truth into my life. And, you know, a major turning point for me was, was I was a hardened, very hardened a- atheist in my twenties. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, I was Sam Harris sort of, um, mm. line mm. of thinking and, um, you know, very polemical towards, towards the of faith. I thought it was ridiculous. And, um, 
you know, at that same time, I mean, it's really hard um, if you're in that line to not go down the nihilism path. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I ended up, you know, 28, 29, had a beautiful wife. I had more money than I ever thought I'd I'd have. And um, my life was empty and it was, I was miserable and I was so tired of me. And I tried to all the meditation and all the things and and none of it was working. And um, then I got started getting surrounded by all these people who were just different. And turns out they were Christians. And I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Christians, come on now. Those people. And uh, it really, it was just this incredible kindness that God showed me. And then over time, just softened my heart. And, and so now, I mean, look, I, I, I follow Jesus. I, I submit to his authority in my life and it's completely transformed who I am slowly, more slowly than I would have liked, but um, it's about him, not me. And it's about this incredible thing that he's doing in the world to restore and renew us and, and creation. So that's the honest truth. Um, I could dance around it, but I might as well just tell you the truth right up front. That's awesome, man. And I appreciate you sharing it. And, you know, and, Nihilism is uh, is a very tricky thing, and especially, I mean, just we got, uh, we won't digress into that. But I, I'm very fascinated with the whole purpose of like, hey, you might as well have a noble aim and work towards it because the opposite, it's not going to be awesome no matter what, right? Like you just might as well. Work. It just doesn't work, just, right? Just, just not practical. It just <laughs> yes. doesn't work. If you if you look at the people who try to to try to make it work, they end up alone and miserable. And mm-hmm. so, well, and I think what's super fascinating when you take that perspective, right? And like you have a, a noble aim. I mean, really intentional growth. That's where, you know, it's kind of the, this whole word of intention is like, what is your intention and what do you want? And what you've built is a platform for yourself, investors and business owners to reach elevations that they probably ha- wouldn't otherwise because of your model. And I want to start kind of unpacking like how you guys go about it because you know, one of the, like I had said, Brent, you know, with these business owners, you know, it's their, it's their baby, their identity. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a financial transaction. We all know that, but like, I mean, when I started the show six and a half years ago, it was on the premise of, it was way more than that. And this identity and like, you know, it's called life after business. And you have taken this approach where it's not just monetization. And you have this wonderful graphic, the drawing graphics you had, uh, that you're putting out on LinkedIn where it's got the private equity, you know, and the two different arrows going the different direction, but then your model is going to the same. So maybe, I don't know what order you want to take this in, whether like how you raise the money, maybe we can start there because I, I think Brent, one of the things that I've been trying to teach in this show is, you know, like you just described your background, that's very indicative of how you're going to raise the money and what intent you have with these companies compared to someone that raises it from the Chicago PD's pension fund. And they need to give the returns in three years. I mean, there's just, regardless of the people, that's kind of like the hierarchy of um, hierarchy of motives. And I think you just kind of described your, your why. So why don't you explain how you raise the, what, what, what do you raise the money on and what, what's your thesis? And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, well, so I, I joke that I'm the force gump of private equity for a reason, right? <laughs> um, we, we've never gone outbound to any investor. And in fact, um, we had, uh, this is probably in 2015, 16, had some investors coming in and saying, you know, hey, we maybe want to invest with you. And they said, you know, we want you to go into either a two and 20 model. So traditional uh, private equity structure where you have 10 year time period to invest the the capital and return it. You typically have a a five-year investment period and then a five-year harvest period. And really, when you think about it, how long it takes to buy a company and sell a company, um, it really gives you about two to three years to do something with the company. (laughs) So time horizon is very short. And uh, you typically are levering up as, as much as you possibly can. And you are changing a lot of things quickly. Uh, because you're trying, you have a lot, you have, you know, decades of work to get done in, in three years. Mm-hmm. And what I saw was it just, it's impossible to make good long-term decisions with short-term capital. Um, the stress of running a company is unbelievable as an operator myself. And that's one of the things that the DNA of our firm, there's no one who's ever worked in traditional private equity who works here. And I don't think we're we'll ever hire anybody. I mean, maybe I, you know, I say that and God's always got a funny way of, as soon as I uh, say something like that, making me do the opposite. Um, but you know, it's for a reason. We want everyone to have uh, a lot of empathy and understanding of what it's like to actually run a business. Because if you only looked at spreadsheets, spreadsheets don't tell you the the story at all. They can help tell you part of the story. They can tell you the sort of the, the, the financial consequences of the story. But the story is always about people, always about people. And so if you've never been an operator, you don't understand the incredible stress, the constant duress, the, the confusion of it, 
right? I mean, it's easy to sit back and armchair quarterback the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're actually in the muck and the mire, the messiness of it, the really difficult, nasty day-to-day grind that it can be, it's hard to see up and down and all that stuff. So anyway, so one of the things that we decided was that we weren't going to take outside capital because the two and 20 structure didn't give us the opportunity to treat companies the way that we wanted to treat them. And then a, a holding company structure also created problems because of, I had no idea how much capital we should raise. And so, you know, every time you raise new capital into a hold co structure, you have to value the assets. And that's always a battle. Everyone always thinks they're, you know, one side's getting a better deal than the other. And they are, right. It's really difficult to value these assets beyond, you know, a sale. And so I just resolved myself to, to not raising capital. And then I met this crazy guy named Patrick O'Shaughnessy on Twitter. And he decided to fly to Missouri and hang out with me. At the end of it, he said, hey, I want my family to invest. I said, well, it's too bad because we don't take outside capital. And he said, well, that sounds dumb. You should take outside <laughs> capital. And I said, well, um, it was literally, it was about like this conversation. For, and, um, forcing the money towards you. I love it. Yeah. I mean, he... he <laughs> One of the, the nice things about being friends with him is he's never he's never shy to call me an idiot, which is almost always true, um, <laughs> which is which is to his credit. It uh, must be obvious to him. And so uh, he said, no, I think that's dumb. Uh, why don't you create a structure that works for you? And then why don't you present it? And I'll tell you if we can do it or not. And so I was like, well, that's a challenge. Um, so I blank page whiteboarded out basically the structure we have now presented to mm-hmm. he and his father. And they said, yeah, looks good. And I said, great. Now what? And they said, well, (laughs) we know a bunch of rich people and we'll help you. And I mean, they did, when I said they did a ton, they did almost everything. I mean, Patrick was setting up meetings. He was like, like, like lead development person for me for a while. Um, and just super gracious and kind and, uh, unbelievably caring. And so, yeah, we ended up raising that first fund, uh, basically from people that, you know, some, some knew me, uh, some knew Patrick and, and his family and, raised that 50 million. And then, you know, as we got steam and we got more relationships and then raised uh, the 300 from about half families, half um, institutions. Um, But our structure is completely unique. And I say unique, I used to say unusual, right? Because it sounds more humble. You don't want to call yourself unique, right? I'm sure somebody else, nothing new under the sun, right? As Ecclesiastes would say. (laughs) And uh, turns out that it is unique, at least from what we can tell. Um, So we take no fees of any kind, there's no reimbursements of any kind. There's literally no cash that comes from the LPs or the portfolio companies to us outside of the fact that when we so we call capital into the, the transactions and then as we're returning cash back cumulative and across the portfolio of companies that we create, then we get to share in that cash flow above a hurdle. So it's incredibly aligning in the incentives. We get paid if the companies perform. We don't get paid anything. And in fact, we pay because we have no deferral of costs. So it's not like we're, you know, we're not making money on dollar one. We're just supporting the team mm-hmm. on dollar one. And so if there's a high return, high probability project to reinvest in, we'd be stupid to not reinvest in that because we want to defer that cash and share in the upside in the years to come. And if there's not high probability, high return projects to do, we'd be stupid to keep the cash in the companies and not return it back to the investors and share in that. So it's this incredibly aligning thing between you know our investors, our team, and the portfolio companies where we're completely aligned to make good decisions. Uh, it's really a thing of beauty. So that's that's one thing that makes us unusual. I, the other thing that makes that. us unusual is uh, we have a 30 year time horizon. So they gave us their money for 30 years. No ifs, ands, or buts, no check off rights. They can't get it back for 30 years. That's incredible. The amount of trust you have to have. I mean, 10 years, I mean, compared to the public mm-hmm. markets where I can commit to you, if you're a public markets investor and call back my capital, like the day after I gave it to you, mm-hmm. 10 years to in private equity seems like an eternity to people who are used to investing in public market managers, an eternity. I mean, us were three times longer than that, which is crazy. And we have an option to renew, I think at year 25, we have the you know, ability to roll forward if we don't, if we want to. So it's, you know, it's functionally permanent capital, hence the name permanent equity. Mm-hmm. And then the third feature that makes this really unusual is we typically use no debt in our transactions. And that's very, very controversial in the private equity sphere. Mm-hmm. Owners typically understand owners don't care, but you know, private equity guys who are all smart, they're too smart for their own good sometimes. Uh, say, well, that's the dumbest thing ever. Why would you not lever up your equity and generate higher returns? Um, and we could talk about that if you want to, but that's been that's been a fun fun conversations I, to have with some of my yeah. brother. <laughs> well, and and there's a, I appreciate the the clear um, layout of how, how you're different and like just a, like in no particular order. I 
One is like what, because I want to go back to the cash flow hurdle and how you're getting the money back and how you're choosing projects, but just kind of put a pin in that for a second, Brent, is like for the people listening and going, how the heck are they getting people to do that with the 30 years? So what's attractive about this model to people compared to other places where they can put their capital? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think if you asked our investors, they would say they believe in the power of compounding, of compounding in relationships and financially, that that results in really great things over a long period of time. And if you interrupt compounding, um, you've destroyed a lot of value. And so if you talk to a traditional private equity person and, and ask them what their biggest losses were, they actually won't tell you about the things that they lost money on, that they that the companies actually failed at. They're okay with that. That's part of the game. It's built, you mm-hmm. know, baked in. What they'll tell you about is the one that they got away because they had to sell them. They'll tell you about the ones that they knew were going to compound for decades, that they said, hey, we've gotten to the end of our, you know, our mm-hmm. fund life, or we have to put some some skins on the wall. Um, to, to be able to raise our next fund. And so, you know, you've got this thing that you're like, oh my gosh, we've got a gold mine. It's the golden goose. It's mm-hmm, going to keep laying mm-hmm. eggs for a long time. Well, let's go slaughter it so we can raise our next fund, right? Um, that's ridiculous. the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. Um, and so our investors uh, look at us and, and I think they say, okay, we're young enough. So I'm, I'm 39. So reasonably, I've got another 30 year run in me. I hope so. God willing. Um, I love what I do. The team loves what they do. All the teams young. I mean, you know, our, our senior teams all in their um, 30s or 40s. And so uh, we've got a long runway ahead of us to be able to keep doing what we're doing. And they think ultimately that the returns that we'll generate will be far superior than if they had interrupted compounding. And that's what you got to believe. Oh, it's so, it's totally makes sense to me, Brian. Like, absolutely. And like, you know, it's so interesting, a couple of data points that I, that, of why I believe that. So Simon Sinek's book, uh, the most recent one, The Infinite Game. I mean, he's like a whole section of private equity of how misaligned it is with the infinite game of just doing things for a long time. And uh, Sonny Vanderbeck, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with him with uh, Satori Capital, but very s- kind of similar, but he did raise a bunch of institutional money. I don't know exactly how to compare it uh, with your structure, but his story, Brent, he goes, he was talking to his other buddies, you know, because he's got like a 30 year whole period as well or something like that. And he's like, yeah, talking about other PE buddies. And he's like, he goes, I was sitting there talking to him. He goes, yeah, the, the guy was bragging about, oh, we had this amazing company with amazing management team, an amazing cash flow, an amazing strategic plan, and we sold it. And Sonny's like, what are you going to do with the money? He goes, we're going to go try and find a company with an amazing management team, an amazing strategic plan. It's just like when you say it out loud like that, it's just so absurd, which I, so it just is so fascinating that there. It, it's I'm watching the investors starting to get it. And then also people like yourself, where there is other people that are, you know, sliding in to, to meet the need. And then as it translates and bring, and it goes down to the owners who are selling, how it impacts their choices. Cause I think, you know, and, and let see if this can come out the right way. It's like, so with the private equity options that people have, you know, the third party, like strategic or third party private equity, there's a certain amount of like criteria. So like in principle, uh, three of our training, we talk about different exit options, Brent, how it impacts your role, the deal structure, et cetera. And people are like, they're like, okay, well, I want more money up front, but I also care about legacy. I also care about my people, my community, the strategic plan of the business, et cetera. And I'm kind of more tired with my role. And so they're like, well, it's kind of at odds because the only other way to kind of meet some of the more like intangible, like nor the personal drivers, which is our principal one, is that you, you could do an ESOP, but you might not have the team or the operations to sustain itself because so much relies on you. So there's this like complete gap of like, I want more of my money now, but I care. Like how, like, and it's like, why is that such a ridiculous request? You know what I mean? I don't know if that, if you can comment or relate to that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's people are, people are trying to make tough choices. And historically the choice has been between getting compensated fairly for the work you've done and giving up a lot in return, right? I mean, when the only game in town is going to buy, lever, strip, and flip, that's the model. And that's what everyone's driving towards. And that's what they'll tell you. Hey, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a big check and I'm going to ask you to walk away and we're going to have to do what we do to make the numbers work. And and look, we're going to load this thing up with a bunch of debt. All of our discretionary cash flow is going to be going to paying off the bank. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be reinvesting back into the business. We're not going to be, you know, if, if things go a little bit south, we got to be, we got to be cutting like crazy. 
to try to maintain margin. So, you know, if that's the only game in town, then, then of course, then it's just a matter of who gets the biggest check. What we say is, you know, we want to partner with, with sellers who care what happens next. So cares what happens next is far beyond just getting the biggest check. Now, now look, somebody's always going to be able to be willing to write a bigger check, especially if you're just levering the heck out of a company with debt, because mm-hmm. it's a heel, heads I win, tails you lose situation, right? And so the question is just how much is an owner willing to get a smaller check, a little bit smaller, hopefully, not a lot smaller. Uh, and we joke sometimes that families tell us, you know, look, money's not our most important thing unless you're not the biggest check, right? Which means that's it. I mean, right. Mm-hmm. It, it's just, all that matters is ultimately what you get at close. And so, you know, a lot of these structures like the ESOP is an example have popped up around it. Challenges with the ESOPs. We get, we get asked to, to buy ESOPs all the time, broken ESOPs and how they typically break is I, I don't know of an, of a company. I, I'm not personally aware of a company that grows dramatically or changes strategy after being, after doing an ESOP. And here's why. Now you have professional managers that are, that are paid fees to obstruct any sort of progress. Their job is to make, make sure that that ESOP can be successful and successful to them does not mean successful for the business. Successful for them means that they don't break the ESOP, that the ESOP can, can pay back the debt that, that was put on it. So it's a highly levered transaction, tax advantage for the seller, right? Highly levered. And ultimately the seller is still a personal guarantor on the note, right? For at least for a period of time, there's some, usually some burn off rights or something that kind of comes along with that. But Ultimately, you you bring in somebody who's a, a banker and, or a third party administrator to be making all the strategic decisions. So if you you know how how every business that we've been involved in has worked is you have these forks in the road where you're like, okay, guys, I think we need to go this direction, but we've got to make major reinvestments. We've got to disrupt our own business. We've got to sort of you know jump the, into the next curve before we're disrupted. No, no ESOP administrator can agree to that because it directly harms the cash flow and the distributions to the ESOP holders, right? And so this is where you get sort of principal agent problems at work. And so, again, the reason why we're doing it the way we we're doing, and I think the reason why we've caught some traction is because we do offer what I would say is the best of an ESOP, which is a kind, generous, long-term vehicle. And we pair that with the professionalism of private equities. We're bringing really legit, heavy duty resources to these portfolio companies. We want to help them grow and flourish. We want to be great long-term stewards. So when you combine those two things, to me, that's the perfect combination. That's where the, that's where the magic happens. So, so Lynn, let's take that a a couple of layers deeper too, Brent, of like with an ESOP, you know, the, whatever management team is there is going to be there, right? Cause it's just a share. It's just a share sale, a, a stock sale with the EIN number. So like Nothing changes operationally. Private equity firm, lots of lots going to change. What? How does how do your guys' deal structures work on the on the asset side, and then how does your deal structures impact the role of the seller? Yeah. So we're trying to buy. Our ideal would be to buy between fifty one percent and probably seventy five percent, maybe eighty percent on the high end. We will buy one hundred percent. There's some good reasons to buy one hundred percent, but we love to have the partners to us, be the people in the business running the business. And so in terms of structure, I mean, we're trying to have them roll forward as much as they really want to roll. Like I said, the last transaction we did um, was a 5149 deal, which is just fantastic. We're super excited about the partners that we get to work with. And and we all have the shared vision into the future. So for us, like our biggest thing is we don't want to try to interrupt the success that's already happened. We think that the businesses that we get involved in, if we've chosen well, and if we're doing the deal, is not because they're damaged or broken businesses. There's there's no rescue that's going on. They'd be successful without us. And it's really important that we come from that mindset because it's a mindset of humility, right? It's a humility in the price we pay, a humility in not putting debt on the business, and a humility in how we treat the, the teams that are there. So we're not coming in and saying, oh, by the way, we know so much. Let us tell you how to run your business that you've been running for 30 years. What we're saying is, hey, you're incredible at the thing you do. We want to be, we want to sit at your feet. We want to learn from you. The first year, 18 months is really just us learning. Now there are some things that we have learned and we have an an unusual view and there's, there's opportunities that we can sometimes see and say, hey, what do you think about this? I'd say more times than not though, they say, yeah, I agree. We've thought the same thing. It doesn't work. And here's why we say, oh, great. No problem. 
right? Mm. So we're trying to take a humble approach to partnering with the people that are already there and trying to win together. And then over time, we're trying to augment that leadership team. Um, sometimes we've had people who say, hey, look, I don't feel like I'm qualified to take this business to the next level. I think we should go out and hire a CEO. We had an amazing self reflective, thoughtful founder that did that with us. And now that person is the president of the firm. There's been a CEO that's brought in that, that, that company is one of the highest performing companies in our portfolio because had the awareness to say, I don't think I'm the right fit to be the top job, but I love what I'm doing now. And I want to be the second in command. Wow. How many people have the humility to do that? Right. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to create an environment that fosters good stewardship amongst the leadership teams, amongst our team and amongst our investors. Well, I think you, you just, the, that last comment is you're, you're providing the environment where that's okay. Right. Versus like, I mean, I, you look at a lot of the traditional PE structures where it's like everybody for themselves, they're worried about getting screwed by the general partners or by the investors or by someone no matter, almost every step of the way. So it's like feast your famine for yourself versus like, Hey, this is actually good for both people. So like with, with like the roles of like the owner or like the, this owner, if there are the CEO or GM or president, whatever that role is, and then the key executive. So is it pretty open when you're approaching it? Do you like, are you kind of assessing the people and the strategies and saying, okay, like, cause it, here's maybe with a more specific succinct question. If, is it, is there like a spectrum of you willing or are willing to have people stay on or not willing just kind of depending on the needs or. Yeah, we just try to be seller focused and leadership team focused. So it's whatever they need. It's not what we need. So we've had sellers before say, Hey, look, I, I'm not interested in rolling forward. I'm not interested in being involved. I'm exhausted. I've got health issues. There's, there's something going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And we say, Hey, we respect that. Um, help us decide what would you do if you were us? And they say, well, I've got this second in command or third in command. They're not quite ready yet. So what I think is I'd have a conversation with them and, and then let's go out and, and find somebody together that we think would be a good fit. We love that. Sometimes we have sellers and we've got a great situation. We bought a business last year. The seller said, Hey, I want to be in full-time CEO for at least the next five years. Great. And then he's yeah. like, over the next five years after that, I'd love to transition to maybe an executive chairman role, start taking steps out, you know, usher in sort of a new, a new group of leadership. And I'd like for you to help me along the way, sell more and more of my stock. Great. That's fantastic. We'd love to do that. And we've been able to, to help bring on new leadership kind of around him and help you know, kind of build the team. It's fantastic. Either way, I mean, look, like no one's perfect and no leadership team's complete. So we're always looking for opportunities to bring on skills that are maybe uh, unusual and experiences that are unusual to help take the business to, to the next level or two. That's, in, that's amazing. And I think, you know, as far as alignment, you were talking about alignment with the investors, alignment with permanent equity and alignment with the sellers. Brent, like one of the biggest challenges I see uh, is the, you know, the hundreds of people that have been through our training is like when there's a lot of, there's a lot, I mean, a disproportionate amount of people with partners, family, whatever, you know, something like that. <clears throat> and because they don't understand the value of the asset based on the cash flow. So there's a lot of financial literacy education that has to go on so we can actually get to the misalignment. That's really the root issue. And I see a lot of it is certain amount of cash flow certain vision of what they want to do with that cash flow, whether it's like you said, distributions or whether it's reinvest for growth and how do we reinvest for growth in something that we have a, a calculated understanding of that will hopefully provide a return. So like, I mean, you're doing it more complicated. You have got more complicated of a situation than anybody that comes with the training because you're, you got investors yourself and partners. You got a lot of people that you're trying to get it aligned. How do you do that? And then maybe the second part of this question, just to kind of tee it up is, how you're calculating or running those scenarios as far as like what the investment, you know, how that return is going to happen. But let's start with the alignment. How do you get alignment with that many stakeholders and something that is generally not very well understood? Yeah. I mean, it's just being transparent with them and talking on, openly about what reality is. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. Like if you don't try to hide reality and you have an, and you have a, uh, you know, a set of beliefs and a, and a set of structures that, that allow for reality to, take place. Like I, it's actually incredibly freeing and aligning. Like I, you know, I hear, I hear you talking and I, I agree that it's, it's, it's weird to say this, but like, I just don't feel much friction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't feel much friction. Uh, I mean, there's plenty of the frictions in the businesses that are being run. The friction's not in our involvement in the businesses being run. We try to be frictionless. We try to be incredibly supportive. You know, we, we talk a lot about around in our office about what is our job. Our job is not for our 
portfolio companies to support us. Our job is to support our portfolio companies. We serve at their pleasure. They don't serve at our pleasure. And I think that's a big inversion from what is typical in private equity, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I've talked mm-hmm. to a private equity friend who says, Hey, I'm going to own this business for no more than four years. There's four board meetings a year. That means there's 16 times to impress me. Don't screw it up. <laughs> that difference. Ooh, that sounds like fun. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, that, yeah. that difference is big. And so mm-hmm. I, you know, I think that by the nature of our structure and the nature of how we go about things, how we think about things and the time horizon, it allows us to be much more aligned in how we do that. We try to find people that are aligned in doing that. You know, look, we, we went out and did a CEO search recently for one of the businesses. And we had a guy who, who we would really have liked to work with. And he said, look, I'm used to private equity. I like the three year sprint. I don't want to do this thing for a very long time. Like that's my game. And we mm-hmm. said, Hey, that's great. Thank you for letting yeah. us know. That's not yeah, something yeah. that we would, we would like to do. So I think there's, there, I'm, I'm not, it sounds like maybe sometimes that I'm judgmental of traditional private equity. I think it's just a different model. I don't think it's optimized as much. But I think people do really well and look, traditional mm-hmm. private equity has returned great returns. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the headlines, yes, they have blown up companies by putting too much debt on them, but there are a lot of great people in private equity. And, you know, let's strongman and say, instead of straw man, right? Let's mm-hmm. strongman yep. and say, traditional private equity can do a lot of good. They bring a lot of professionalism and a lot of very smart, thoughtful people to the table in these businesses that maybe need some of that. And that's why they've done well. So mm-hmm. I just think that we're just, we've got a slightly different tick to ours and we're doing it, we're doing it in a bet in a way that creates the, an opportunity for the best nature of who we are to shine forth and, and protects us against the worst of our nature. I very appreciate that, uh, that explanation, Brent, because I, I don't think I've had, I articulated like that where like, you know, because the, the, I, I, 10 years ago, because of some of the issues that we had in our family business, I, I felt like I got the raw end of the deal on some financial people that knew more than I did. And they used that asymmetry, asymmetry of knowledge to their advantage. So I like a little jaded, uh, you know, it's taken a lot of years to kind of calm that down. But it's what I've realized is there's a place in the market for all these different mechanisms, right? So to your point, it's not good or bad. There's a reason in the market. And I think where the, the, there's an interesting gap is it's the not it's the education you wrote i mean you wrote the messy marketplace for a reason because it was all the conversations you probably had over and over and over again you're like hey you, here's here's what it is and i find it fascinating that when you do have a simple structure that is aligned you don't have to like try to hide it up right you know you just like here's what it is and it's a fit or not a fit and it's just it's got to be a lot more freeing i can imagine compared to some of the other people that you know so hard discussions have to happen Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are messy. We're messy. Situations are messy. And, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of angst around, well, what role will I have? Well, what compensation will I have? Well, all these things. We just try to talk very just transparently about it and just say, hey, this is the way we're thinking about it. how are you thinking about it? How can we get to where we're thinking about the same way? And ultimately, like, let's try to align ourselves to where we can do good things together for a very long time. And if, it, if anything's not sustainable, right? I mean, if you think about it, relationships are a multiplicative system, there's a lot of opportunities for zeros in there. And unless everything's sustainable, unless they're, they feel well compensated, they, unless they feel appreciated, unless they feel fulfilled in what they're doing, it's not sustainable for them. And unless we feel the same way, it's not sustainable mm-hmm. for us. And if either mm-hmm. of us think it's not sustainable, then it's going to end. And so there's a lot of that need for upfront, kind, but transparent discussions around expectations. And we try well, to have think, them. We've learned that over a long period of time. Well, I, I love it, man. Cause like, if you really think about it, all of the potential negative things that you and I could uh, bring up, it, it's, these are just like mechanics in a deal structure of a P, you know, a P, a traditional PE deal that, I mean, it's driven by the, it's really driven by the timeline and like what the rest of their portfolio rate of return is and what's direct. Cause like, again, you could get cute with all the different deal structures by not being transparent because your goal is to get back to the 21 IRR that you're going to get your investors. Cause that's your fiduciary prudent obligation, right? Versus saying, Hey, the infinite game, man, like we're in this for a long, like you just think about just that polarization of just the motives, how that trickles down. And you just, like I said, I don't think it's necessarily good or bad. It's just like in our training, we have like a list of like 40 questions, kind of like your book, like ask all of these things. Cause it doesn't mean the person's good or bad. It just means that this could be something that there may or may not be using depending on the character of that person. Yeah. There's no, it's not good or bad. It's aligned or misaligned. That's it. 
What do you see as the, you know, when you said you were the Forrest Gump of the, of this part of the, the flavor of, of uh, permanent equity, like, what do you see in as far as like trends of like what's happening of other people, other investors popping up? Because here, here, maybe here's part of the question, Brent is like people that are going, huh, this is interesting to me. Obviously you can't buy everybody out there. So like, what are the different, uh, what's a fit for you guys? And what are you seeing as other places that are popping up where people are kind of modeling or having different variations of your, your model? Yeah. I mean, thankfully, and I say this truly, thankfully there's, there's, there are, you know, other people doing it and trying to do it. I mean, what I would say is that not a month goes by where I don't have somebody reach out to me. In fact, the call I got off of just right before we hopped on, uh, was from a guy in Florida who's, who's, who's doing it. Um, he's doing, it sounds like a great job personally. I mean, look, I, I plan on giving everything that we make away, uh, during my lifetime to either the employees that I have or to, to organizations that we want to support. So for me, I mean, the game is not about accumulation. It, it is about how do we, how do we change, change the game and how do we maybe impact the world in ways that we want to. So for me, I take great pleasure in having somebody say, Hey, I think that you've got a better way. I don't look at it as a threat to us. I don't look at it as competition. Mm-hmm. If, if somebody would be, I mean, look, if, if we help put somebody into business or help them, do what they're doing. I mean, I'm, I stand on the shoulder of a tremendous number of people who've thought about this stuff. It's not like I came up with these ideas, you know, sort of de novo. Um, I mean, come on, man. Like that's not, no one's that smart. I'm certainly not. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff is just taking bits and pieces from what I saw and trying to understand how the game was being played. And so I hope that to be honest, I only hope that people adopt a lot of what we're talking about. I hope that they innovate and create better models and look, if they want to disrupt us, that sounds great. Like I, I'm not worried about it. Um, the difficult part is, is not in the structure. The difficult part is not in the desire. The difficult part is in the execution and the judgment. Like there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom and it's taken a lot of education. A lot, I paid a lot of tuition in the knowledge to education, uh, knowledge to wisdom transition. And so when we look at a company and we say, well, I like these attributes and, you know, I don't like these attributes, like those are very different today than what they were five years ago or even three years ago. And we're constantly being honed and refined on, on how we think about things and what we look at things and what our opportunity costs are. And so look, the world is big and that's the beauty of capitalism is there's a lot of people to step into the gaps and there's a lot of money to be made in doing things that frankly, permanent equity doesn't want to do. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of money to be made for permanent equity in things that other people don't want to do. We all got to find just who we are and trying to quit, trying to be somebody else. Um, I think the more that we can just learn what it is that turns you on and, and, and make sure that you're comfortable in that. Right. Cause like I wouldn't be comfortable in a two and 20 structure. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do well for me, but for maybe for some other people, it's perfect. Two and 20 is great. They love those short cycles. They love the sprints. They love the pressure of it. That's fantastic. Do it. I'm not making a judgment against that. So back to your tuition comment. So like, because I love the the knowledge to wisdom and like, so are you willing to share like how your thinking has been, you know, has evolved and maybe a couple of your tuition payments that you've, you've, uh, you've paid, maybe you're willing to share a couple of them with the audience. Oh man. How much time do we have? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I've got, I've got a decade plus of, of tuition, uh, and I pay it every week. So, um, yeah, I mean, maybe we could talk, maybe zoom out a little bit and talk broadly about mm-hmm. there's something called the value curve. And so it's the, it, it, on, on one axis is the price you pay. And on the other axis is the quality of the business. And so, you know, as you pay more, typically you're going to get a higher quality business and everyone, the easiest thing to know is if something's cheap, right? That's, it's the most quantifiable. It's the most straightforward. It's very easy to understand if something's cheap, you know, just sort of objectively financially cheap. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't explain to you is the quality of the business. So cheapness is just a, it's just a measure of price, not of quality. And Mm -hmm it's easy to know what the price is. It's really hard to know what the quality is. And that's where I would say over time, a lot of the tuition has been paid around. What are we actually buying for the price we're paying? And so I would say earlier on, I was much more interested in paying a cheap price, no matter what I would let really great companies that I knew we could do really well with fly by because they weren't willing to take a cheap offer. I think the days of that happening are behind us. And I think that 
you know, over and over, that doesn't mean overpay. And by the way, I think you can flip on the mm-hmm. other side and say, oh, well, we're happy to pay up for quality. A lot of people have that mentality. And by the way, if you think about it, traditional private equity, how you make money is by gathering assets. How do you gather more assets? Well, partially by buying, doing bigger deals. Well, how do you do bigger mm-hmm. deals? Well, either buy mm-hmm. bigger companies or, or you just pay yep. more for them. Mm-hmm. And what if you did both? What if you paid up for bigger businesses? Now you've got a heck of a fee generating machine, right? So this is the the, the mindset and the thinking. And we, we don't want to go that direction. And we don't want to go the direction of being cheap. So we don't want to be cheap and we don't want to overpay. So what is that? That's wisdom. Mm-hmm. I don't know how oh. to say it. And so if somebody sits with me and asks me questions about, well, wait a minute, how do you look at this? Or how do you think about that? I can tell you in each individual case, like how we're thinking about it. I'm not saying, by the way, it's not like I'm the Yoda of private equity or of investing. I mean, gosh, like I think I've got a lot to learn. I think, in fact, I think I'm probably the second best investor on our team. I don't even think, I don't even think I'm the best investor on our team. Um, I think Tim Hansen, who works with us, uh, works with me as our CFO is the best investor on our team. Like, I think he's got a much better mind on this stuff. So again, we're always learning and we're always calibrating, but I would say is we're much more excited about building on something solid, building on something very, very solid versus before it was kind of like, yeah, it's a complete shit show. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and and I joke and it's all cheap. businesses, <laughs> right? It's che- it's a cheap shit show, right? Like, and, and yeah, I, I exactly. if, you, if, if if you asked me, like, what was our you know what was our investing uh, prior to even you know even a few years ago, it was like we buy cheap shit shows, um, <laughs> yeah, and you know it. we try not to make them as 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 shit showy as yeah. that, that's a lot of the the, the, the shit. Word, it's, all, anyway, it's a good it's, um, it's a good adjective that is in the spirit, good kind hearted spirit of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, look, and, and, and when I say this, let me let me back up and maybe maybe caveat that because that can sound very judgmental. All businesses are loosely functioning disasters that happen to make money, right? Mm-hmm. Like all businesses, if they make money, happen to make money in spite of them being disasters. And I'm talking about bigger businesses too. Anybody who doesn't get that has never worked in a business. So well, when I say you're, 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 cheap- you're messy, yeah, your messy marketplace title of the book just says it all, Brent, right? Like exactly, exactly. It's Everything's messy. messy. So, so what I would say is we are, we are now the mess is so maybe think about this is all investing is tolerating risk is tolerating messiness. You're just trying to know what type of risk you're tolerating and under what circumstances and our taste for tolerating certain types of risks have gone dramatically down and our willingness to tolerate other risks have gone up. And what that kind of, when you, when you sum all of it together, what does it look like? It, it means that we've moved up the value curve and mm-hmm. eventually, so everyone starts low on the value curve, buys cheap and everyone mo- starts moving up. And then eventually you stop and you stop in an area where you feel like that you can get the optimal Mm. sort of value, right? The price Mm. to the quality ratio is the value Mm -hmm. is the highest for you. And I think that what's interesting is everyone, you know, when you think about that, when I think about that, I've often in the past thought about as being a static curve, right? The nice thing is it's not. The curve is actually relational to who you are. So if I bring a new skill set to the table, if I bring a different skill set than you do to the table, my value curve is going to actually look different than your value curve. That's mm-hmm. what makes the economy so dynamic and so incredible, this thing called capitalism, because actually who we are and what we bring to the table changes the game. It's a complex adaptive system. And so that's where value is all defined based on your opportunity costs and what skills and, and things you're bringing to the table. And so and it's abundant in the, in the, the pie raises too. you know, what? Um, it's just top of my mind. Cause I just read uh, Dan Sullivan's book, uh, who not how, and you're talking about like two people and then the whole pie grows. And that's like, you know, you could probably sit there and analyze again, all this financial seven ways to sound of the strategic plan, but then the people are the people that have to execute this stuff. So you're probably spending more time on your character analysis. Like, yeah, okay, great. The financials are good. Great. This looks good. But like, are the people good people? Are they crazy? Not crazy. <laughs> At the end of the day, do you well, trust them? Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, here's actually an interesting thing. So I would say, I think it's way too easy to get into a mindset of good people, bad people. I think that's a lazy approach to analyzing people. I think that we all are deeply broken and we all have a lot of messiness about us. Now we're just differently predictable in our messiness. And there's certain types of messiness that we're willing to tolerate in people and other types that we're not. (laughs) So, so it's, uh, you know, I would say that there's no, no one we look at and say, Oh, we want to partner with them because that's a good person. I would say we want to partner with them because we can understand and predict how their messiness is going to interact with our messiness. And we're willing to tolerate and to help them. And we want them to help us 
grow out of our messiness and into sort of a better place. That was awesome, man. I, I really like the point. That was, I really enjoyed that. So I know we're uh, short on time here. So I got a couple, uh, two last uh, final questions, Brent is one is uh, best place to get in touch with you and permanent equity. Yeah. Permanent is the website. Um, I'm on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm very accessible. Um, I'm happy to try to be helpful if anybody out there wants to reach out. I mean, I try to be responsive unless you're just blatantly selling me something, just hide it a little bit from me, you know, just, just go softer, a little softer on it. And I'll probably <laughs> respond. That's awesome. And I, I, I smile when you said the, the email or the, the URL, cause like, isn't it nice that you don't have to give this big explanation <laughs> of where to find you? Uh, I got Correct. It is that. very nice. Um, uh, the last question, Brent, and it's, uh, the podcast name is different since the last time you're on it. So I love to ask what their, uh, people's definition of the word intentional is. Um, I've learned a lot from the hundred plus times I've asked it. And so in your words, your thoughts, what does the word intentional mean for you? Intentional means living an examined life and being willing to see yourself for who you really are and see others for who they are. and the thing that I've probably learned is being intentional means judging others by the same standards that you try to judge yourself from. And I mean, that's very difficult. We try to judge other people by their actions and us by our intentions and, and look like the reality is we're all, we're all bumbling and stumbling our way into this. And so the thing that I, I see most people doing that I did for a very long time was ignore all the red flags in my own life and focus on other people's red flags. I'm trying to do the exact opposite. So I'm trying to live, live self-examined. I'm trying to, I'm trying to hold myself to the highest standard I can and lower my expectations for others. Just try to help them as best I can. Brent, thank you so much for blessing us with your wisdom. And I appreciate you coming back on the show. I know you're a busy man, so I can't thank you enough. And Ryan, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. You're, you're so darn good at what you do.